Bandieri, the I run the Middle East program at the Wilson Center. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome back to the center uh, Patrick Tyler, um, a former public policy scholar at the Wilson Center. Um, Patrick is a journalist and author whose career in newspaper spans 30 years and includes 12 years at the Washington Post and 14 years at the New York Times, where he was chief correspondent from 202 to 204. He anchored the Times coverage of the invasion of Iraq in 203 and established the Baghdad Bureau of the Times after the fall of Saddam Hussein. He left the Times in 2005 from, for his post as, uh, from his post as London Bureau Chief to write a series of books on American diplomacy and international relations. Uh, his two previous books are A Great Wall, Six Presidents and China, which won the 2000 Lionel Gelber Prize for Best Book on international relations, and his first book was Running Critical, The Silent War, Recover, and General Dynamics. This book, The World of Trouble, The White House and the Middle East from the Cold War to the War on Terror, is a must read. It's a fascinating account of uh, five, five presidents who had to deal with the Middle East, and I must say, I was surprised to see that I thought this is a phenomenon for the Middle East only, that when a new president comes to power, they'll undo whatever the previous president has done. But I noticed that this had become a pattern here too, and it was uh, uh, quite disturbing. This really, as I said, is an amazing read, and uh, once you start the book, you can't uh, set it aside. I mean, it is, you get enmeshed in it, and it's, it's just superb. So with that in mind, I think we'll ask Patrick to speak to us, explain the book in maybe 35 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to your questions and uh, comments, and then he will sign books. Patrick, yeah. Thank you very much, Hala. It's uh, wonderful to be back at the Wilson Center. I, uh, uh, this project started here in the Wilson Center back in 2005, 2006, <clears throat> and it's such a wonderful venue both for study and research, but also for these convivial and congenial uh, collegial encounters over research and work and ideas and debate. Um, we arrive here today uh, with the promise that there's a new era in the Middle East uh, but it uh, yet uh, uh, flummoxes us on what to call it. Uh, if, you, if you take a comparison between today and six months ago, there's certainly a completely different feeling about the prospects for the United States in the Middle East. But uh, in fact, uh, 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 very little has happened yet. Uh, one, one is tempted to arrive at a venue like this to try and get a cell phone number for George Mitchell and ask him what the hell is really going on in the... <laughs> in the Holy Land and, and whether he's carrying a new message to Bibi Netanyahu or whether he knows when Syria is going to break or what, uh, what uh, um, Bashar al-Assad is going to do. Um, uh, but uh, we still don't know. We don't have the framework, uh, the architecture of this new era, just the great expectations uh, that it's going to be uh, uh, a better one than the last, and perhaps very hopeful for peace in the region. Um, the, um, I've been traveling back and forth to the Holy Land for the past year, spending a month at a time doing uh, interviewing for a new book, which is a, a profile of the Israeli security establishment that has an 
taken shape yet, so I won't describe it in any more detail than that. But I must say, I've never seen so much optimism about uh, over the prospects on getting a deal between Israel and, and Syria. And that in itself could establish a real new momentum in, in the region. And momentum is everything uh, in, in the Middle East. So expectations couldn't, couldn't be higher. My book, a World of Trouble is a history of American presidents since Eisenhower. You said five. I think we have to count up. There's more than that. <laughs> I think it's ten, but I collapsed a couple of administrations together. Uh, um, but it's at least eight. Um, uh, it's, a, um, it's really a, a profile in presidential frustration uh, because the common thread in our history since World War II is each president has come to office with very high hopes uh, and very big plans to do something about the Middle East. And the, and the problem is, in, in the simplest form, is that it's very difficult for a new chief exec executive who arises in our, from our basic political context, this island between two oceans in which we, uh, from which we engage the world. And very difficult for him to get the education he needs and for him to uh, uh, find his way uh, in a policy sense to prepare himself for a very complex uh, set of countries, set of issues, uh, and set of personalities. Um, a World of Trouble is a, it's a narrative that documents the fact that the person in the Oval Office uh, has not had an easy time. For 60 years, they've the presidents have basically been trying to make peace or just prevent war, and the record of success is thin. And I think one, one reason is what Hulla mentioned a, a minute ago. Each president certainly does want to distinguish himself from his predecessor. It's a very human trait. Um, contrast is, is the engine of American uh, politics in, in, in a very real sense. But there's also a more subtle explanation, that is American policy in the Middle East has had no overarching imperative of national security similar in intensity uh, to what drove us during the Cold War. The intensity of that threat of mutual nuclear annihilation is what focused American leaders on basic fundamentals, diplomatic engagement with the enemy, and profound alliance structures uh, across the Atlantic. In the Middle East, we have had interests, interests in oil, interest in keeping the lines of communication open through Suez to connect Europe to Asia, interest in managing the emergence of Israel in a manner that doesn't destabilize the region, interest in controlling the arms race, uh, especially the spread of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, interest in fostering development and prosperity, not for any sentimental reason, but because prosperity is the thing that contained tame the fires of grievance and post-colonial anger that was uh, common in the region uh, after World War II and still exists in a deeply embedded uh, psychological sense today. So imagine the presidential frustration for someone like uh, Dwight Eisenhower coming into office uh, in the midst of the Korean War, in the midst of something he couldn't even recognize at the time, which was the rise of Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt and pan the pan-Arab movement that was coursing across the region, the overthrow of, of Mossadegh in Iran that was soon to take place because Churchill couldn't stand the fact that that swine had taken British oil interests in Iran. Uh, and you had 700,000 Palestinian refugees living in squalor from the 48 war. Nothing had be do been done about them. And Israel was already a feisty power uh, by the mid-1950s, looking to exploit any collapse uh, by the young King Hussein across the river uh, in Jordan so as uh, to seize the West Bank, which Israel saw, ben David Ben-Gurion saw, as the natural boundary of Israel. Uh, the CIA at the time thought Nasser might be the West's man uh, in the Middle East. Uh, here was this charismatic figure that united uh, the Arabs in such a profound way and had such a strong voice that crossed boundaries and, and touched the uh, uh, Muslim and Arab uh, instincts across the region. Uh, and 
uh, it was easy to see how uh, Kermit Roosevelt and, and th those who were responsible at the time, Alan Dulles, of dealing with Nasser, what potential he had uh, if he could be drawn into the Western camp to oppose the Soviet uh, uh, interests in, in making advances into the region. And boy, were we wrong about Nasser. When Eisenhower looked out across this landscape, his political instincts told him that <clears throat> East and West, the superpowers, would be competing for the hearts and minds of millions of Arabs and Muslims and Persians. Uh, now that we are one superpower, uh, the struggle remains for hearts and minds uh, in the region. Uh, but the competition has changed, and I don't think you can describe it any more succinctly than it's kind of us versus the fringe. Uh, Eisenhower wanted to build uh, hydroelectric dams uh, uh, across the Jordan Valley and across the barren hills of the arid hills of the, of the West Bank, thinking that a greening of the Holy Land would be the thing that would draw the Palestinian refugees out of their camps and solve that most festering problem early on. Uh, and that peace would follow. And he had sent a, a very creative uh, uh, emissary out, Eric Johnston, uh, uh, to talk to both the Israelis and the Arabs about how to arrange the water rights in the, in the Jordan, how to bring hydroelectric power, how to make that blossoming of the region agriculturally into a political instrument of reconciliation. And... and uh, um, uh, who's to say exactly why it failed? It was basically overrun by time. It was overrun by budget constraints in the United States to fund the, what was essentially a Tennessee Valley Authority scale project uh, in the region. Uh, they divided up the water rights in a way that, pe uh, uh, that actually got a, a, a remarkable amount of agreement. Um, but it stopped there and was soon overtaken by the events as Nasser <clears throat> sought to arm himself in a profound way and, and touched off the events that led to the Suez Crisis in 1956. Jumping ahead a little bit to JFK, uh, he, he learned during his transition that Israel was secretly building a nuclear reactor complex in the Negev Desert that uh, would be able to produce atomic weapons someday. And we have one of the leading authorities on this subject in the room here today, my friend uh, Abner Cohen. Uh, Kennedy wondered, wondered especially uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, how he could work to enforce a non-proliferation regime in the world, especially with China and India coming along uh, as would-be nuclear powers, if he could not prevent tiny Israel uh, from getting uh, the bomb. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if this can be proved, but my, my own instinct also about Kennedy is that after the October crisis with, uh, over Cuba, is that he saw that issue, uh, work uh, non-proliferation, test ban treaties, etc., as the issue that would carry him into a, a second term, and therefore the the Israeli nuclear complex was a, was a larger political threat uh, uh, to his uh, uh, political future, and for that reason, all the more uh, imperative that he tried to stop it. Uh, Amos alone, the great Haaretz uh, uh, correspondent, once told me that he and Scotty Reston were cruising through one of the hallways in the West Wing one day in 1963. Those were the days when you could cruise the halls, hallways of the West Wing, uh, and ran into JFK, uh, who had just uh, been uh, briefed on the latest reports about the Demona nuclear reactor and was livid and determined in his comments to them that he was going to roll this back. He was going to convince Ben-Gurion that this was a disaster for the region, that this would incite eventually, if not tomorrow, a nuclear arms race. It would incite the Soviets, perhaps, to put nuclear weapons into Egypt. Uh, Amos said he went back to his office and typed up a dispatch about this in, in, uh, remarkable presidential encounter and sent it off uh, to his uh, editors and to the censor in Israel, and it never saw the light of day. It was spiked immediately. And Scotty Reston, uh, we, we don't know from his records, uh, we certainly know from his, uh, from his published work that he, he never wrote about this encounter with JFK, but the Times during the 60s did very uh, aggressively follow this issue and broke some of the first important stories about Demona. In 1973, uh, Leonid Brezhnev literally 
got Richard Nixon out of bed at San Clemente during the summit uh, uh, of that uh, summer when Brezhnev had come to sign the uh, much va uh, vaunted uh, agreement on the prevention of, of nuclear war. Uh, and he wanted to tell Nixon uh, that uh, though it hadn't been on the agenda, they had to talk about the Middle East because war was coming in the Middle East, and he wanted to explain that to Nixon. Of course, Brezhnev knew that war was coming in the Middle East because he was arming the Arabs, and the Arabs were all about retaking the land they had lost in 1967. The whole program of rearmament was focused toward uh, a crossing of the Suez Canal with a a missile wall that the Soviets would help build to stop the Israeli Air Force from being predominant over the battlefield and shoulder-fired anti-tank weapons to stop the Israeli, the superior Israeli tanks. Um, but uh, one has to look at, at uh, and there may be some Cold War experts uh, in, in, in the room to whom this would make a, a great deal of sense, uh, that at the time Brezhnev was also testing detente. Detente was already uh, under assault uh, in the Senate. Scoop Jackson was a vocal uh, a critic of it. Uh, um, but Moscow had no interest in seeing a second round of war. I mean, there had just been 67, then there had been a long war of attrition. Moscow saw no uh, useful uh, uh, consequence of another, another major war uh, in the Middle East. And so Brezhnev's uh, interventions at San Clemente, I think, can be seen as a genuine attempt to avert uh, uh, the crisis that he knew was uh, coming. What he wanted to do, very simply in that conversation, which is recorded by one of Henry uh, Kissinger's dictated uh, uh, memcons uh, of the time, which was uh, declassified in recent years, is to establish a set of principles that Dobrynin and Kissinger could take charge of to, and, and the effect of these principles would be to show the Arabs that they could safely enter into a negotiation without it being a trap from their, from their perspective. And, and among those principles, this, uh, Brezhnev was not just peddling the usual Arab terms. He was talking first and foremost about security for Israel in the, and, and that would have to measure up, stand up to Israel's expectations. Yet Nixon, and it's this, it was the summer of 1973, Nixon was domestically paralyzed. Sam Irvin had the Watergate hearings going on Capitol Hill. Uh, the administration was under siege. And uh, you see from the conversations that both he and Kissinger had that summer that there was absolutely no interest in getting up on the high wire. Uh, from a diplomatic standpoint, to try and field an American and Soviet proposal for negotiations in the Arab-Israeli dispute, when all it would draw would be ne neuralgic reactions from the pro-Israeli camp in the Senate, uh, from the Arab world, and from all of the players uh, in the Middle East. And there was a, a, a determined or a decided lack of political will or, or capacity perhaps is the better word, for Nixon to take this on. And he tried to explain this to Brezhnev, and Brezhnev kept, came, com, kept coming back at him. And this transcript is, is very much revealing in the doggedness with which the Soviet leader comes at the issue and doesn't let go of it until the point that Nixon has literally grabbed a pillow from the edge of the divan and is resting his head on it, listening uh, to the Soviet leader as he continues to make the case. Um, we all know what happened. Four months, uh, Nixon, Brezhnev didn't get what he wanted. Four months later, war did break out, and it was the most devastating uh, war in terms of the death toll proportionately for Israel in the history of its wars. And so it was uh, uh, a, uh, a, a terrible consequence that was, that incited in, domestically in Israel the uh, uh, tremendous recriminations over the failure of intelligence to see the, uh, that, that Sadat was determined uh, and, and to change his stars, as it were. But the Israelis never understood at the time that the fate had also been sealed by this conversation between Brezhnev and Nixon at San Clemente in June of 1973. Uh, Nixon was paralyzed in that summer and uh, he demurred. And, uh, that was the, uh, the great tragedy and, and an, an example of how domestic politics uh, uh, prevented uh, 
a, uh, one of the most urgently required uh, interventions for peace in, in the Middle East. Uh, I'll mention another uh, example that I'd like to cite, uh, in, and that is in, it, from the Lebanon War in 1982 when Menachem Begin presented uh, Ronald Reagan with a fait accompli by moving the Israeli army into Lebanon to destroy the PLO and to defeat Syrian power in, in Lebanon. You find a truly befuddled uh, Ronald Reagan who could not decide whether it was a tragic mistake to allow this invasion uh, uh, to continue or whether it was a triumph over Soviet-backed forces uh, in the region. And you literally see through the, uh, the cabinet discussions uh, uh, the uh, Ronald Reagan on the fence between uh, Gene Kirkpatrick on the one hand saying, you know, Cap, you talk about Arafat as if he were some kind of agrarian reformer. He's a Soviet-backed terrorist. We need to destroy him. And, and Reagan would say, yeah, I'm, I'm with Gene on that. And then someone would come in and say, Mr. President, this is a disaster for Lebanon. You've, you've, the Israeli army has trampled over a million Shia between its border and, and uh, uh, Beirut. The uh, Pandora's box has been opened. It will take uh, decades to get this back together. It is destructive uh, and not constructive uh, politically. Um, he couldn't make up his mind, and it caused his biographer uh, uh, to call his approach uh, 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 to the Lebanon war uh, cruel innocence, cruel because he couldn't make up his mind, uh, and when he couldn't, he would slam his fist on the table and simply walk away as if the scene had ended and his involvement had ended. Um, history shows us that there is no simple uh, formula for breaking the code in the Middle East, but I think from Eisenhower's time to the present, you can make a couple of observations about tools that have been degraded uh, or, or nearly lost. Um, one, one is, I think that we have lost to a certain extent the ability to believe or have confidence in the multinational role in the Middle East. Um, our faith in institutions that we largely shaped uh, to resolve uh, conflicts uh, has eroded, and yet uh, joint action by NATO, uh, the UN peace, under UN peacekeeping mandate, even even unilateral deployments with international backing, uh, have great potential when they are commanded by seasoned and, and experienced and determined leaders. And if we don't take our responsibility to shape the peace in the Holy Land. Uh, we leave Israel in the impossible position of defending borders that are not fully under anyone's control uh, except the hooded guys with rockets. And, and that is an impossible situation to leave another country in. Secondly, I think American leaders have lost confidence to some extent in taking the initiative at a time when Israel has preempted the field with a military operation. Uh, I think a good example of that uh, it was the raid on the Syrian, the so-called Syrian reactor in September 2007. And it seems to me that in, in that case a great opportunity was lost uh, to take the intelligence case of what Syria was up to uh, up there near the Turkish border uh, urgently to the IAEA or to the Security Council to declare the evidence which uh, by, by what we uh, eventually saw was quite compelling uh, and quite overwhelming that this was a mirror copy of the uh, North Korean uh, nuclear complex and to get a judgment uh, including one with a with a deadline that didn't preclude an ultimate uh, military response uh, so that Syria would have the opportunity to uh, respond but also for the UN uh, the international machinery uh, to be vested with the credibility to work. Uh, and in, in, both, in, in the case here, both of the Israeli security establishment and the American security establishment, there was not enough faith in those uh, institutions or that the process could be successful uh, for the risk to be taken to intervene. Uh, and I think that was a, a lost opportunity and reflects, uh, reflected poorly on the Bush administration uh, at the time, but also on the international system to do what uh, we expected it 
have expected it to do in, in the institutions created since World War II for conflict resolution and intervention. Um, it won't be easy for a, um, oh, well, let me just make one other uh, quick point in, 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 on, those, on the item of, of intervention. President Eisenhower, uh, during the Suez crisis, uh, did feel that the issue was joined on, on an international community uh, response, international system response. And he went over the head of uh, Congress. He went on national television, one of the first times it was used in this, in con in this context, and demanded that Israel withdraw from Sinai uh, during that crisis and, and brought to bear a, a great deal of political pressure on David Ben-Gurion, uh, who um, realized uh, that the whole system was arrayed against him. Uh, and that he would have to back down, and he did. Uh, he, got, uh, he got a good deal out of it in the sense that he got the commitment of the international uh, 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 community to the concept of freedom of navigation in his southern ports, which was important to Israel. But it was not the key issue of the war. It was, a, it was, a, it was an, uh, almost an afterthought, uh, and it, it was a, a, a face-saving uh, uh, a gesture by the Eisenhower administration that helped close the deal. Um, LBJ, uh, looking at the conquest in 1967 of I I Israel, did, as, as far as I can determine, uh, and maybe there's someone in the room that can add something uh, to this question, uh, didn't spend a great deal of time considering whether to do what Eisenhower had done. And it's, it's not clear that in 1967 even Eisenhower had, because uh, the circumstances had changed so dramatically. And there was a sense that the Arabs, that Nasser had put his army into the field, brought an enormous 80,000-man army into Sinai, threatened to uh, throw it against Israel's borders, and uh, Israel preempted uh, with spectacular results. And once it had... Uh, was holding Sinai, the Golan Heights and the West Bank said, now we will trade land for peace and the, and the cost of the return of territory will be permanent peace uh, between Israel and its Arab neighbors. It was not unreasonable to expect uh, Johnson to think that that was a fair and equitable way to approach it at the time. Uh, but would that, he, would that he had had the wisdom to see uh, the difficulties uh, it has caused for the process since. President Reagan considered sending a very large force to sort out Lebanon in 1982 um, after Israel invaded. Uh, and he uh, turned to an aide at one point and asked, uh, what did Eisenhower do in 1958 when he was confronted with the Nasserist Nasser threat to, to, to Lebanon uh, at that time? And one of his young aides, a, a Navy lieutenant commander named Phil Doerr, said to him, well, uh, President Eisenhower sent 19,000 troops into Lebanon, stabilized the situation. They stayed there as long as they needed to stay, and then they withdrew when the threat re uh, receded. And uh, President Reagan looked out the window for another minute and then turned around to his young aide and said, well, you know, I didn't have the War Powers Act to contend with. And he just shook his head and walked out. Uh, it won't be easy for a new president, uh, but the positive uh, reality is that there are, there are truly soaring expectations for U.S. diplomacy uh, in the Middle East, and that uh, creates its own uh, imperative uh, and opportunity for American diplomatic activism. So uh, we are able to hope for the best in the region uh, while continuing to prepare for the worst. And so now I would like to pause and, 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 and take questions by quoting my favorite line from Yitzhak Rabin, who used to stand up at political gatherings and say, now the good news, I am the last speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me ask you uh, the first uh, question. Why, I mean, why was... Bush too so disinterested in the Middle East, and why did he think that by just not getting involved, the problem would be just solved by itself? You know, I think that is almost a psychological.
question about uh, George W. Bush. It, it, it is really hard to fathom uh, when you reconstruct uh, his own uh, experience as a vice presidential son and then a presidential son in the White House. He was around the issue uh, for a long time. He had friends. He and Prince Bandar were reportedly drinking buddies back in the Reagan administration before he went on the wagon. Uh, Bandar, I don't think, ever went on the wagon. Uh, uh, and he had seen the, he, you know, he had uh, seen his father deal with the issue at the United Nations. Uh, he had uh, been uh, politically sentient when Jimmy Carter went through the Camp David process. Uh, but I know he came into office saying to a lot of people, as almost as if he had a chip on his shoulder, that you weren't going to catch him spending hours at Camp David with Middle Eastern leaders or turning the White House into Motel 6 for Yasser Arafat. Um, or, or, or expending the what little political capital he had on butting heads against a Middle East problem that by the time he inherited it looked even more ferocious and complex than the one that Bill Clinton had taken on and had failed at in his, in his estimation. And so I, I think also there's, there's a question here of domestic, his, his own perception of his domestic constituency, also that it was not a good issue in which he would take on Ariel Sharon uh, or set off uh, the, the conservative Christian base or the pro-Israel pro base in Congress, that this was all part of his natural political base, and he saw no future in it. And so I think he invented a kind of approach to the Middle East in which he knew uh, the value of a good speech and a good line and a, and a, a good conceptual framework. And he, uh, he articulated those, sometimes in a powerful way, when he talked about the two-state solution, and when he talked about uh, there needs to be a Palestinian state within three years, that the, the Palestinians deserve better leaders, etc. It sounded like he was interested in, in, in uh, uh, determined and, and uh, concerned, and yet he never mobilized the bureaucracy the way the presidents had who uh, who uh, were were determined uh, to make progress in peace and it just uh, by the by the end of his eight years it was almost kind of a cynical joke that he was uh, uh, constitutionally interested in the issue uh, to have and, and to invest the kind of time that was necessary to solve it uh, yes please and then yes uh, if you could just Wait for the mic and state your name, too, please. Uh, I'm Jerry Olick. I'm a retired intelligence analyst. Um, from your remarks, I look forward to reading your book. Uh, but my question has to do with uh, there being already an imperative, the, the nuclear imperative and the oil imperative in the Middle East, uh, that should be enough to make us really want to help shape peace there, as you say. But in, in my view, and that's my question for you, uh, what your view is on this, the pro-Israeli bias, especially in Congress, but among presidents as well. Take, for instance, what you described in Nixon and, and uh, Brezhnev when Nixon says, you know, the domestic situation, the constituents aren't going to buy this thing. We get deep into it. Or in the case of Bush, W., uh, that he was surely driven to some extent to keep his hands off the Middle East because of the strong pro-Israeli bias in his administration and is still in Congress. To what degree, uh, to me, that's a very, very important impediment for us to play a big role in the Middle East. Can it, do you agree? And what can be done about it if you agree? No, I, I really don't agree. Um, uh, certainly there is a pro-Israeli uh, constituency in the Congress, in the American public. Uh, the, if you go back to uh, the creation of the Jewish state uh, uh, and, and the, the end of the war, uh, the groundswell of American opinion supporting uh, the creation of Israel was much broader than the Jewish community in the United States. It, it, is, it is a bigger issue than that. Uh, now, uh, in, uh, I guess uh, I've, I've heard Tom Dine, who was here uh, w when I was a, a, a fellow here, and, and I once interviewed about the rise or the, of the effectiveness of APAC during the 1980s when the, when the Senate went Republican. And up, up until uh, 
that particular decade, Tom said that the focus of, of, of APAC had always been on having a secure base, a rather small base of Democratic uh, members, mostly in the Senate, who were the core of the, of the um, uh, pro-Israeli camp uh, in, in the American legislature. He said that, that what what, what happened in the, uh, in the 80s was the sense that it could be much broader, that, that the constituency wasn't tapping its natural fulfillment, and, it's, and it has grown. Uh, I would only argue that there are lots of big constituencies out there uh, that affect American public policy. This is one. It, it has been a prominent one. It has been overcome at, at times uh, by other interests, interests in oil, interests in, in, in solving, in, in peace, uh, frankly. I think Jimmy Carter, to some extent, and he bears the scars of it today because the, is, uh, so many people in Israel see him as a hostile, a hostile American uh, leader, but he accomplished a, a great deal by pushing the, the peace agenda and overcame, uh, I think, s some of those uh, uh, constituent interests that our president in every debate. Uh, I, I, I guess, uh, having been a reporter in the city, you know, over 30 years, I, I tend to think of this as a diversion, the, the constituency issue. There are lots of big constituencies in Congress, and there are lots of counter constituencies that call uh, the issue and that um, uh, develop counter strategies to point out when uh, constituency policy, uh, politics gets out of whack. Uh, and so I think our system uh, is the best controller uh, against it. Maha Kadura from the Wilson Council. I'm looking back to the history of the relation between the White House and the Middle East. Can you see a possibility now to have the White House to have a very good relation with Israel and to try to solve the resolution, the two-state uh, solution? which I think it is a great – if there is a possibility which uh, this solution might change the image of United States and the Arab world and the Islamic uh, world, is there any contradiction between have the good relation with Israel and working on the um, – two-state solution? My, percep my perception is that this president uh, uh, feels very strongly that he has arrived at a point of that, – that there's an element of destiny in the timing of his presidency, and that he has come to office uh, beyond those decades in which it was taboo in this city to talk about Palestinian rights or Palestinian homeland. Remember when – Remember when uh, Jimmy Carter came into office and, and used those phrases, it set off the Jewish community against him and caused him a great deal of, of – of, uh, um, put up a, lot of, um, a great many political obstacles as he then worked through what he wanted to work through in the peace process over the next uh, two years. I think Obama feels uh, – President Obama feels that he has arrived when there is a consensus uh, uh, for the two-state solution. And that that's a historic opportunity. Uh, he has um, uh, uh, picked good counselors. Uh, he has put a team in the field. Uh, we are still waiting to see uh, uh, the results. But uh, to get to the point of your question, I think there are people in the region who are arguing that perhaps the window has closed on the two-state solution. I think there are people on the Israeli right uh, uh, who feel this to a certain extent. Uh, there uh, are uh, people who are talking about, again, about the Jordan, the Jordanian option. Uh, um, um, but the way I look at it is that there's nothing that trumps uh, politics in the Middle East like a strong American presidential intervention. And what we feel now is the predicate being laid for one. We haven't seen it yet. Uh, we keep hearing that the president is going – he's got another speech uh, beyond the one he made in Turkey that he's going to address to the Islamic world. Uh, uh, so the shoes are dropping one by one, and we haven't seen the main act, the main event. But I, I think it's – I personally think it's possible. Uh, I think it's going to take a lot of work, and I think presidents in their first term are always a little wary of taking this issue on. But I think this president has also taken on board the notion that it is essential that he make some basic moves in his first term to get it – move the process moving, both to take advantage of the opportunity that exists on the Syrian track, but also to reassure the Palestinian track 
lest there be another intifada over, you know, a, pre a new president chasing the other woman, is what sh the Palestinians call the Syrian track, the other woman, uh, lest th that the Palestinian track get destabilized. It ha he has to move in a complex way, and, and things are truly interconnected. Yes, please. My name is Mike Hager. I'm with the Education for Employment Foundation, which works uh, throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I, I'm interested in the issue of uh, how much freedom uh, our presidents have, particularly looking now to Obama. Uh, he, uh, he made a very significant statement, I think, when he visited a a AIPAC before he was elected. Uh, and uh, he's now made statements that indicate more even-handedness. But even-handedness was a word that couldn't be used very easily by American politicians just a few years ago. Now he's facing uh, a right-wing government in Israel. Will he be able to, will he be willing to use uh, strong methods to have an even-handed approach, uh, even such as reducing or cutting out foreign aid to Israel, or taking other really harsh steps that may go to the core of historic relationships with Israel? Don't know. <laughs> um, the basic challenge for a new president, uh, and I don't think you're going to hear the, this president use the phrase even-handed this only because it was poisoned by the governor of Pennsylvania when he went out for Nixon, I believe it was, on a tour of the region. Uh, for Nixon uh, during the transition, and I think he was crossing the Allenby Bridge and said something about this administration is going to be more even-handed the than the last. And of course, the Israelis loved Lyndon Johnson, and they saw this as code language that somehow the balance was going to get shifted in a negative way. And uh, what was the governor's name? Was it Scrant huh? Scranton? Scranton. Yes, Scranton. William Scranton. And and Scranton was taken off the list for potential cabinet appointees immediately. And the word, the phrase was uh, banished. Uh, President Obama is certainly is facing a great challenge in, in uh, building a relationship with Bibi Netanyahu uh, because it will be Netanyahu who has to make peace with Syria, which is the, the shoe that most people identify that is likely to drop first and may have a a constructive effect uh, on the uh, on the sequence and the momentum for peace in the in the region. Netanyahu, I, I was just in Israel last month and was asking people, do you think Netanyahu has changed? Because you know the security establishment in Israel did its best to overthrow Netanyahu uh, in in uh, at the end of his uh, at, at the end of his term in 1999. Uh, former generals were coming out of the woodwork. In fact, they were resigning posts in his cabinet, saying that he was a dangerous man for Israel and, and built an opposition against him and ultimately got behind Ehud Barak, who defeated him uh, rather uh, 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 significantly. Uh, so the question is, what, what has, has he changed uh, from the erratic, somewhat erratic uh, uh, politician he was uh, during the 1990s? Uh, does he still represent that kind of hard right uh, ideology of the Jabotinsky revisionist movement that believes that uh, Israel uh, uh, should not and, and can never uh, give up any of the lands it acquired from the biblical land of Israel? Um, I think we're going to we're going to find out. He's been he's. He's not bowled anyone over with his cabinet choices. His minister of foreign affairs is a rather scary figure to a great, you know portion of the uh, heads of state in the in, in the United Nations and and uh, uh, he has built one of the largest and un, most unwieldy cabinet uh, uh, governments uh, that's ever been erected in uh, in Israel uh, but he is the one who pursued quite vigorously in complete secrecy a, a, a deal with uh, Syria uh, in 1997 and 98 and I, I think that uh, uh, it is impossible to 
regard a political figure like that and not say that he must have learned from his past mistakes and that we're going to see a different iteration of the man. Uh, he's got Ehud Barak in his cabinet uh, in the defense uh, post and that's a very powerful post and Ehud Barak believes very, very strongly uh, that uh, Syria is the, is the strategic play for Israel, uh, as do many senior figures in the Israeli security establishment. So um, I think we will soon uh, uh, see his first opening and also see the first uh, uh, iterations of a new relationship with a new um, a president. It would be great if they got along. Uh, whether uh, Obama will someday be threatening to pull his aid tickets or hold up weapon systems, yeah, you can speculate about that. It doesn't mean anything. I think the most effective American presidents who have engaged in that kind of pressure have lied about it, uh, have done it. Uh, without telling anybody. Richard Nixon pulled uh, uh, phantom jets uh, off the produc production line for, for Israel to send Golda Meir a point that she ought to be dealing with Sadat. It uh, didn't have any effect on her. She was <laughs> the Iron Maiden. Uh, but uh, 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 Eisenhower uh, used strong but uh, sub rosa methods, and I think that's the way it has to be. In our media age, it's very difficult to play diplomacy that way. and. Uh, uh, so uh, it's impossible to predict how it will play out. But I think pressure ultimately is, uh, if we get active diplomatically in the region again, and if there's going to be peace, pressure will certainly be part of it on all sides. Um, yes, uh, the gentleman and, and then the lady. Yes, uh, can you wait for the mic? Yes, please. Thank you for your narrative of the history of ten presidents, except for one who was a general, Eisenhower who came in with good intentions and they really wanted to make a difference in the Middle East and they all couldn't because of the Israeli lobby in this country. I remember President Barack Obama when he was campaigning and he went to Jerusalem. At the end of his visit, he said a statement. I can't remember it for word for word, but he said, I wonder, people say things about Israel here that we could not say in Washington. And I think it, it is very sad that this is for the interest of both Israel and the United States to get a peaceful resolution for this country. However, the extremists here and in Israel are in charge of the agenda. Do you agree with this analysis? Not fully. <laughs> Um, as I said before, I, th I think the constituency politics are there. They're part of our political fabric in this country. I think it's broader than the Jewish community. Uh, and uh, certainly the, uh, there are effective lobbies uh, uh, in, in the Congress uh, uh, that are as big or bigger than the uh, Israeli lobby. Uh, I don't think you can say that the Israeli lobby has prevented a determined president from uh, uh, a major uh, policy initiative in the region, huh? What did? Well, let's take the Persian Gulf War, 1991. Oh. Um, there, there was a case where President Bush uh, marshaled the uh, the uh, uh, allies in the region into a coalition to take on Saddam Hussein. He had a very difficult uh, problem in dealing with uh, Itzhak Shamir, the Israeli Prime Minister, because Israel was getting hit by a barrage of Scud missiles that that. Uh, as Saddam Hussein was firing from the Western Desert. And yet, uh, President Bush was able to convince uh, Yitzhak Shamir to, uh, Shamir to stay out of the war for the, for the greater good of the coalition and its overall aims uh, to defeat Saddam Hussein and push him out of Iraq. Uh, President Carter uh, got the F-15 sale through the Congress despite the best efforts of Tom Dine and, uh, and APAC. I think he'd, he, he'd admit that he was, uh, he was defeated. And similar uh, uh, numbers stacked up on the AWAC sale a few years later in the Reagan administration. Um, there are, uh, uh, I know we've just been a, through a case here, and, and, and I'm not an expert on it, in which uh, Jazz Friedman was named the um, new chairman of the National Intelligence uh, Council and withdrew and made a very strong statement that it was the Israeli lobby that defeated him. And uh, uh, since I'm not an expert, I, I shouldn't uh, say this, but uh, my sense is, 
is, is that it was an overstatement. Uh, uh, and, and I don't think that uh, the lobby is dictating uh, appointments in this administration. I think it's inf influential, but I also think the oil lobby and the auto lobby, uh, have you ever covered John Dingle's committee when an auto industry issue was, was uh, in the air? Uh, there are lots of uh, lobbies, and it's, we, we, we have those kind of constituent politics, and, and uh, as I said, there are plenty of loaded guns uh, to counter them uh, and to uh, um, uh, kind of shine the light on them when, they, when, it, when their sense is that they have uh, overreached. And the lady, and the, yes. I have to say I've been very surprised by both the questions and the, the focus, because given what the title of this talk was, it was the Middle East from the Cold War to the War on Terror. It wasn't um, what I think is last decade's issue, which is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I'd really like to hear what you, you, you talk about Iran, uh, nuclear, a nuclear Iran, and the destabilizing effect that has on the entire political region um, I should have introduced myself. I'm Carol Greenwald. I'm on the board of GINSA, the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs. And the people we talk to, which includes a lot of people from other Arab countries, is that there's a realignment. I won't call it exactly Shia Sunni, but it's certainly Iran against uh, an array of other powers that Egypt used to lead in saying we were the, the regional power here and that the alignment is really much um, Israel is our friend because they're the enemy of our enemy. So that there's a realignment going on that has nothing to do with the Palestinians and is maybe much more of much more interest to the country, to the region, and therefore to us. Um, let's take another question too, and then you and then I'll answer. Yes, please. Um, in terms of the Palestinian leadership, how important is the lack thereof? Given that most of the Israeli leaders have not been really a, a, a attractive or appealing to American public opinion, that nothing it would really help the Palestinian cause immensely if a Nelson Mandela type leader were to arise and be able to um, appeal to American popular opinion the same way that Gandhi. Gandhi was invaluable in getting Indian independence probably decades earlier than it might have happened because he was able to, his great appeal to liberal British public opinion. And there's the, the Palestinian leaders heretofore have not been admired by any, any significant number of Americans, even those who do want a, a two-state solution. The second part of my question is how central is a two-state solution to moving um, toward general Mideast peace? Well, let me first start off with an apology. Did you say Carol? Yes. Okay, to, to, to Carol, uh, all I can say is, is that I think I called this a history. So yes. <laughs> I've written a history of American presidents dealing with the, the region. You're quite right that Iran, uh, as we sit here today, is, is the looming uh, uh, threat over the, the nuclear program, is the looming threat perception uh, o over the region. Um, but but I, I would argue uh, the, uh, about its, uh, the interconnectivity of the heat and fire of the, Israel, the Iranian revolution today uh, with the single issue that has animated politics in the region since 1948, and that is the Arab-Israeli dispute. And I don't think you can ever separate the two. I would just argue with that instinctively from all my experience uh, and my research. Uh, 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 doesn't mean I'm right, uh, but it's my very strong judgment. Uh, I think the... Uh, the the uh, uh, realignment that you're uh, talking about is is uh, 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 hard to measure, uh, uh, but it is also opportunistic. Uh, I, I wouldn't argue that it was deep, uh, uh, but it is in that Middle Eastern way. The enemy of my enemy is my uh, friend, and the uh, there certainly has been a, a, a defensiveness and a 
uh, sense of fear in the in Sunni Arab capitals about the uh, strategic predicament they are in uh, and what to do about it. Uh, during some of my interviews with the, uh, the, the Saudi royal family members for this uh, book, uh, I, I discovered that going back to the Clinton administration that Prince Bandar had been going into the White House asking that the moderate Arab states uh, be considered to be placed under uh, some kind of nuclear umbrella, perhaps not directly by the United States, but perhaps by NATO, perhaps under some UN uh, uh, architecture that would give uh, uh, those states a sense of strategic uh, reassurance uh, as the threat uh, developed uh, uh, from Iran and, and if the uh, Iranian nuclear program uh, fully blossomed. Um, Hard to say where we're going uh, uh, on this issue. I noticed my former colleague David Sanger uh, 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 had a nice piece uh, uh, about the new administration adjusting its its policy approach to Iran on the nuclear question, and that Hillary Clinton's people the next day trying to roll it back and saying we weren't reconsidering that uh, point. Uh, um, the uh, Dennis Ross is uh, is uh, circling uh, uh, through the administration and the region uh, with a policy uh, whose uh, architecture is, is still not clear to um, uh, the public or anyone in Washington. Um, and so, um, uh, again, we're 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 still waiting uh, for how this administration mobilizes itself to deal with this particular threat. I. I, I my instinct is that they're they're first trying to find some channels that don't have anything to do with it uh, uh, to uh, make uh, to erect a, a dialogue on that will allow them to have a serious uh, um, uh, level of engagement when uh, when they really need it uh, and that uh, you're still very much at the beginning with a regime that uh, uh, our political establishment has been very neurologic on since 1979, uh, and we've been very um, uh, hamstrung on, on uh, how to find channels uh, to communicate with it. Um, so, um, on the Palestinian question, uh, I, uh, I opened one of these chapters, I think it's the Clinton chapter, with the President of the United States uh, uh, in a total panic trying to make sure that Yasser Arafat didn't kiss him in front of uh, in front of the White House press corps because he was sure that such a picture would haunt him till his dying days and would ruin him uh, politically and he spent a great deal of effort right before that great meeting on the South Lawn with uh, Yitzhak Rabin and, uh, and Yasser Arafat ensuring that when the handshake was over and they got ready to walk down that Arafat didn't turn around and plant a big one on him. Uh, uh, and Arafat, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't uh, sometimes choose the leaders of uh, national, libera la uh, national liberation movements. I, I remember when Jonas Savimbi was leading the Obambundu uh, faction in the Angolan Civil War that he struck quite a dashing figure for a brief period of time until some of the allegations that he was murdering people uh, out behind the, you know, the Quonset hut uh, uh, surfaced and his uh, political sheen began to uh, tarnish uh, dramatically. Uh, the, uh, this is a group of leaders who uh, coalesced at Cairo University in the 50s as young, radical Palestinian Students determined that the are upset. That just changed something. Is that better? Can I put it here? <laughs> I thought that changed. Uh, thought that the political leadership of the Arab world had betrayed them. Uh, wanted to uh, take the struggle uh, directly to the Israelis. Wanted to be part of the Fedayeen, the self-sacrificing. Uh, terrorists who's, or militants who snuck across the border of Gaza and shot at the kibbutzniks of uh, the Negev Desert. Uh, uh, I remember the opening of uh, Abu Iyad Salah Khalif, who was uh, the number two in, in the PLO, or number three, uh, writing his, in his biography about his first memory of you know getting into a makeshift boat at uh, Jaffa with his family and women screaming and throwing babies onto the 
onto the raft to get away from the bombardment that was coming uh, into, into Jaffa. This was the event that defined their lives. They call it the Nakba, the disaster for their people, and, and it created a group of leaders. Arafat, uh, I think from the beginning, was never the most uh, attractive, but he was the most irrepressible. Uh, he had this manic habit at meetings as a young man, apparently, of, uh, uh, of just starting to shout down his uh, critics and to dominate, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the agenda with the noise of his voice uh, and his uh, histrionics. Um, uh, there are some uh, quite remarkable uh, uh, figures in the, if you've ever attended a Palestinian National uh, uh, Congress where all of the leaders, all of the abus get together, there are some, uh, you, you see the diaspora quality of the Palestinian movement. There are, you know, businessmen from Havana or from Buenos Aires or all the places around the world where Palestinians dispersed, uh, started new lives, uh, built businesses, made money and supported their cause over there in the Holy Land at a, at a distance, uh, but didn't get involved because it, there was no way to do it. There was no way to bring their money back to the Holy Land to find a Palestinian state in which to build a house and build a business uh, uh, that could prosper. I think uh, we will see, like any movement, the evolution to uh, a new set of Palestinian politics, and we will see new faces. There are lots of young Palestinians. I think the, the, the leader of that, uh, if it turns out to be a country within our lifetimes, the, the, the leader's face we haven't seen yet. Um, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. I strongly recommend you get a lot of answer to the questions you have by reading the book. And Patrick was not able to cover the whole book, but thank you very much for coming and welcome back. My pleasure. Thank you.